The past few lessons have been introduced to the basic components of a fugue, the exposition and the episode. Most fugues as a whole simply alternate entries and episodes. They may also contain strettos, but stretto is not essential in a fugue. In fact, most fugues by Bach do not include strettos. Fugues are musical compositions, and the difference between a good fugue and a bad one is ultimately a musical question. The general principles of composition that I will refer to here in relation to fugue are discussed in greater detail, along with many other principles, in my book, Musical Composition, Craft and Art, published by Yale University Press. The composer Elliot Carter used to say that an essential characteristic of good music is convincing continuity. In a good fugue, the joints between the entries and the episodes should never create bumps in the form. The material used in an episode should always grow naturally out of something prominent that is very recent and still fresh in the listener's memory. An episode must also lead convincingly into the next entry. Often the composer will prepare the entry with a rising line or a suspension, creating a sense of expectation that will be fulfilled by the coming entry. Since a fugue has no major formal contrasts, it's by nature a highly continuous form. The fact that all the contrapuntal material is derived from the subject and countersubject, laid out early in the exposition, means that fugue is a very concentrated form. This results in a certain characteristic intensity. Although there are occasional humorous fugues, like the one at the end of Verdi's Falstaff, for the most part, fugues tend to take advantage of this concentrated intensity. It's normally rather a serious form. Now let's look at how a whole fugue is put together, going through the procedure in detail. Our practice fugue here will have the following subject and countersubject. The subject is short, made up of a couple of motives, marked here with letters. The countersubject adds a bit more material. The reason I've marked the first motive both as A and A prime is that A prime is just a part of A, but it sometimes appears separately. The whole fugue will order these motives, plus occasional neutral lines like bits of scale and suspensions. Once we've analyzed the motivic material like this, the next step is to draw up a stretto table. Here's an example. The subject is on the top staff. Below it, I've copied and pasted the subject at various time and pitch intervals, testing all the possible strettos with this subject. For the time intervals, since the subject starts with an upbeat, I've systematically tried every upbeat from the end of the subject back towards the beginning. For the pitch intervals, I've included every diatonic interval. I could have done the same table above the subject instead of below, but the only interval that would change character is the fourth, which will become a fifth, and vice versa. The beginner should probably completely write out both versions above and below. Some of the strategy in the table are marked OK, some are marked with three periods, and others are marked X. OK and X need no particular explanation. However, the ones marked with three periods are examples that are weak in just two parts, but that could become usable with the addition of a third part. Let's see how that works. Here, as an example, I'll take the closest stretto on D below the subject and add possible notes underneath that would make the harmony viable. This is not necessarily the final baseline for this combination, just a reminder of what it could take to make it work as a three-part counterpoint. Since this subject takes a tonal answer, I've also worked out a stretto table with the answer form, this time above the subject. Since the tonal answer has a modified beginning, it works in different combinations. Again, the student should do tables both above and below the subject. As before, the strettos are marked OK, X, or three periods. The point of these tables is not that the fugue must use all or even some of these strettos. Rather, this is a systematic way to explore the subject's potential for imitation. One could do the same thing for the counter subject as well. One other experiment is in order before actually writing the fugue. Since the subject is short, it's worth trying it inverted. A long subject is usually too difficult to recognize when inverted. If the inverted subject is pleasing and memorable, the composer should experiment with its stretto tables as well. An additional stretto table combining the normal and inverted subjects may also be worthwhile. This could either start with the original subject, imitating it using the inverted form in stretto at various pitch and time intervals, or vice versa. These tables 
represent a fair amount of work, but doing them results in a level of fluency with the material and its contrapuntal possibilities that makes the actual composition of the fugue much easier. Now we can begin to compose the actual fugue, first in sketch form. We've already seen this process in previous lessons. Usually the composer will sketch one section at a time, then work it out, then proceed to the next section. To save time here, I'm presenting the sketch of the whole fugue at once. I've indicated all the entries, the episodes, and the modulations, as well as the climax and the ending. I've also added the bass line at times, either to clarify the harmony or else to enrich various suspensions. The student should pay attention to the joints between the entries and the episodes, noting how episodes draw on recently heard motives and how entries are prepared. For example, the episode in measure 4 clearly echoes the entry in the middle part of bar 3. The suspension on the third beat of measure 5 creates momentum into the entry that starts on the last beat in the bass. A careful examination of this sketch shows not only the basic alternation of subject and episode, but also, at times, groups of multiple entries and episodes. Such groups can be useful to create more intensity or relaxation than would be possible with one at a time. Another point to notice is that the subject and the countersubject can occasionally be varied. If we look at the entry that starts at the end of measure 8, we can see that the last motive has been altered to allow for a suspension with the B-flat in the top voice. Often the rhythmic values of the first few notes are changed as well to flow better with what comes before. Note also that the subject does not always need to appear with the contrasubject. Note the episode starting in measure 11. It contains three separate sequences. It's important that not all the sequences be instructed in exactly the same way. For example, one might be imitative and another would have just each part repeating its own material. The climax at the ending is in four parts instead of three, which poses no problems here since this is a keyboard fugue. The important thing here is that we're composing a piece of music. We must develop the given material as a coherent, contrapuntal conversation between all the parts. While maintaining a general sense of smooth continuity, we must gradually build intensity overall, while also allowing for moments of breathing or relaxation. Finally, we need to reach some kind of a climax. The climax may arrive at the end, as here, or it may be followed by a kind of resolution winding down the tension. In the academic school fugue, the student is provided with an exact sequence of modulations, episodes, and even a stretti, which is meant to be the same for every single fugue. While this may be pedagogically useful for beginners, it's the exact opposite of real composition, where the flow of the piece grows out of its distinctive material. Not even one single fugue by Bach follows the form of the school fugue. Furthermore, there are no two fugues by Bach where the details of construction are the same. For now, the main limitations the student should respect are 1. Start with a relatively short subject. 2. Stay within closely related keys. If you touch on the tonic in the middle of the piece, make sure that something else in the music lets the listener know that it's not the end of the piece. 3. Vary the construction of the episodes. Work to create smooth continuity into the episodes and momentum into the entries. 4. Make sure you're aware at every moment which is the leading part in the texture. Don't obscure it with too much activity in the other parts. 5. The climax should reach some kind of extreme. For example, the highest or lowest notes, the most intense harmony, the fullest texture, etc. Here now is the completed fugue.
We have now reached the stage where mastering fugue requires lots of practice, including advice and correction from a good teacher. This online course can substitute for a teacher, but at least it provides the necessary explanations as well as the reasons behind them. The student should now complete the expositions and episodes worked out in the previous lessons, aiming at creating waves of gradually mounting intensity and release to arrive at a successful culmination, while maintaining smooth continuity overall. As in all contrapuntal study, quantity counts. A serious student will need to complete at least five or six fugues with detailed critiques and revisions from an experienced teacher to begin to approach mastery. In our next lesson, we look at a large fugue by Bach to see these same principles applied on a much larger scale, creating a masterpiece of musical architecture.